Welcome to Citizens Forum. Uh, today we have with us uh, Chris Cook, and Chris is uh, is the uh, host and producer of Gorilla Radio, as we uh, know on uh, CFUV. And uh, Chris is uh, coming in to talk to us often about issues, particularly around uh, issues in the in the Middle East and and the usage of media. So welcome, Chris, and uh, thank you for coming in today. Well, it's nice to see you again, Walt. It's been a long time since I've been uh, gracing uh, your studios here <laughs> it's our at pleasure. Citizen Forum. <laughs> you know, and I want to congratulate you uh, for keeping the show on the air. I know it hasn't been easy. You guys have had some challenges over, uh, over these years. Your content is edgy. It upsets people, which is exactly what media is supposed to do. Uh, and you take some flunk for it, uh, some flack for it. Uh, uh, but I've got to say, you know, I'm saying all these nice things about you guys, but I've got to admit, you know, full disclosure here, I have more than a passing acquaintance. I've been on this program, I think, I don't know, five or six times maybe over the years that you've been doing it. Yeah. But my association with the producers here go way back, uh, back in 2007, in fact. Uh, Jack Etkin, your producer, and I got together and we sat uh, pitching a show called Public Access to Shaw that we went and made on our own up at Camosun College at my old uh, alma mater, the um, ACP, the now defunct Applied Communications Program. Hey, guys. Um, so I, to the fact you guys have been doing this all these years, you know, like, like coming a decade now, and through all the adversity is terrific. And, and you know, it couldn't be more necessary. I mean, the, the state of journalism and media when uh, Jack began this project was pretty dismal, but it's gotten worse since by, by uh, you know, multiple degrees. I think it's the thing that does motivate us, and I know it motivates you too, is just trying to find the truth, uh, try to understand it, and to try to convey it to the public. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, when you look at, the, look at the mainstream media, there always seems to be some type of a spin on almost every story. It almost makes it impossible for the general public to understand. Well, confusion, you know, confusion is uh, uh, one of the tactics of disinformation. You know, you feed them loads of information, some true, some not, and, and it, it's baffle gab. Uh, people just don't know what to believe in the end, and they throw up their hands and walk away or watch the football game or, you know, or, or whatever, you know, the, the soap operas, and just say, well, this is beyond me. And, and the, once these people are X'd out of the equation, democracy begins to become meaningless. And we saw this in the United States. The Republicans have long tried to uh, marginalize participation. That's been one of their main strategies. Uh, Mr. Trump picked up, you know, as much as he said, oh, well, the, uh, the election is going to be fixed. He was per telling the truth. It, it was fixed. It was fixed in his favor. It was fixed because he um, uh, is a proponent of racist uh, ideology. His supporters are some of the most uh, virulent racists in America. And what they attempted to do and succeeded was to limit the participation of minority voters and especially the poor. So one of the ways they do this is through uh, uh, confusion and misreporting stories. Well, we, the most bizarre election campaign in my life. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I had a hard time following the, 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 what was really happening, and I really did not know uh, what, how this was going to, what was going to transpire. I, wasn't, I wouldn't dare have, have guessed it, although about a week before <laughs> the election, I got that inkling, I got that feeling <laughs> that, oh no, the inevitable, you know, the, the, the impossible is about to happen. Well, I, you know, it's, don't hold me responsible, but I did call a Trump victory. And I can prove it. It's on the tapes of the Gorilla Radio. I, I did it on the air, and much to the annoyance of my American guest, who, who at one point said, why do you keep saying Trump is going to win? To which I said, deja vu, baby. I was thinking, of course, about uh, Mr. Reagan and then Mr. Bush. I've seen this before. But yeah. really, honestly, I didn't believe it. I mean, I called it, but I didn't really believe that it was possible that this, the, um, this orange-hued, knuckle-dragging, Neanderthal uh, troglodyte <laughs> troll you know, and, and could actually the are take it. I, mean, I never really, I never raked over the ashes too much, but 55% of white American women voted for Trump. 
I'm not sure about the poll numbers. That, I'm not sure what I believe, and they're still counting, right? Okay. I mean, he did not get uh, the majority of the vote. No. He got the, as George W. Bush did in his first election, he got uh, the Electoral College, as everybody knows. He didn't yeah. get, you know, he was more than $2 million, or two, uh, two million <laughs> votes, uh, but uh, dollars uh, is another thing. Yeah. Shy of Hillary Clinton. Now, and, and to be fair to Mr. Trump and to Mr. Clinton, or Mrs. Clinton, I mean, she, she was not a, a candidate anybody wanted either. I mean, South Park did a great send-up of this that I can't repeat on, on family television of what they compared the two candidates to. But this was a classic example of this, where you've got two people that it, it, people only decided who they hated the least, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's not a good start, because that keeps people at home, too. I, the last figure that I heard was 55-ish percent uh, uh, of the people uh, uh, actually participated and, and many thousands, hundreds of thousands had their votes uh, stolen essentially. You know the polling was strange, just like the polling was strange in the last provincial election here where we had Adrian Dix well ahead oh. and then all lo and behold he was behind. Uh, and I think uh, with the, the polling in the United States always showed Hillary somewhat ahead and, and it was short, short for, of a victory, and then, then mysteriously she lost all that support. Well, do you think that was perhaps part of the manip manipulation of the voter turnout? Well, I think when, when one party is deemed to be a, a, a runaway favorite, people don't come out to support, people that might otherwise stay home. They go, oh, yeah. well, they don't, she doesn't need my support. Everybody called Hillary, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't even going to be close. So similar, as you mentioned, yeah. to that NDP uh, uh, yeah. fiasco here. Um, but, you know, I watched the debates and that's when I really thought she wasn't going to make it. She had no answer to, um, to Trump. And he was being easy on her, I thought. Yeah. Uh, the, her association with Wall Street and some of her foreign policy uh, stances are, are terrible, yeah. especially to the doves of the Democrats. And even the libertarians that might have said Trump was too much and supported a Democrat, uh, they couldn't support her either because the libertarians don't want to see more wars. And this you know, is too, exactly you know, the what Bernie she support, pushing. the Bernie Sanders support that the Hillary is counting on. They, they'll just hold their nose and they'll vote Democrat. But I think there was so much sourness, particularly yeah. after the California yeah. primaries. It really did look like Hillary or the Democratic Party cheated. They did. And it was rigged and it was a preview of what was happening in the national election, yeah. too. Uh, they stayed home, a lot of them, and, and, or moved over to Green or even Libertarian. Or just, you know, maybe even Trump, too. I think he got a lot of supports yeah. like the old Dixie Democrats in the olden days. They just went Republican. Uh, she she cheated Bernie out of it. I'm not sure that Bernie, you know, he quit even before Al Gore did, you know, way back when. You know, he just yeah. walked away and didn't say anything about it. But, um, yeah, th that put a sour taste on everything for sure. Well, you know, they're, they're, the Brexit thing in, in England, and they're saying the Trump Brexit era. And the thing is, is that I'm not so certain, like, the Brexit vote was a bad idea, and I'm not so sure the results were so bad either because the public did speak. They, the, the, the elites were trying to jam down the throats of the people in England, yeah. uh, an, uh, an immigration policy particularly, that was very hard for them to stomach. Well, I think, you know, the immigration thing was used as a bit of a, a stalking horse, I think. Yeah. People are, uh, they, they have, uh, you know, the, the middle class is dying and it's been dying for a long time. The people are uh, desperate. They're, they've seen their standard of living go down the tubes. Yeah. That's really where it's at. And, and they're angry. And they are angry at the rich people. They're angry at the politicians that never give them a straight answer. I mean, they're even angry at their, at their sports teams, you know? I mean, they, they're, they're angry. And so if you're standing there saying, well, hey, I, you know, I'm with the, the establishment, vote for me because I can make the establishment better than ever, they're not going to be there. If you go there saying, yeah. I'm going to throw a hand grenade into the middle of the establishment, yeah. well, then you've got a chance. And Trump did that, you know. Yeah. But I mean, right now, you know, media is so important. Uh, right now we're seeing this, this uh, hue and cry against fake news, so-called. Yeah, that, that's you know? what we were going to talk about. And, and the fake news um, hue and cry is a setup. And, and I believe it's a setup to push Trump into a corner during the campaign 
He talked about pulling American forces out of Syria, out of uh, the Middle East, drawing back and not spending all this treasure uh, on these foreign adventures. And that got him a lot of support uh, that he wouldn't have otherwise had. They held their nose uh, on all his odious, grotesque, uh, personal uh, yeah. uh, peccadilloes and voted for him anyway, hoping that he could do something to bring America home and, and, and stop the, this, the, the, the millions and billions of dollars that are bleeding out of the American economy yeah. going into these wars that he was lying is, is yet to be seen. But these groups are using propaganda to try to push Trump into a no-win decision to up America's involvement in Syria first and then move against Iran and Russia, uh, the two allies that are defending the Syrian government right now. Now, who is these groups you're talking about? Well, the main one, and we heard this in the news just this last week, yeah. it's called Prop or Not. It's a shadowy organization that came on the internet scene with, a, with, I mean, we've been talking about the new Cold War. You know, Putin is Hitler and Russia is evil. Once again, for you and me, got people that are old enough to remember the old Cold War days, it all sounds really familiar. For people even older than us, they might remember uh, the Red Scare and the McCarthy era, you yeah. know, Joseph McCarthy. Well, we need, it seems, a McCarthy, a new McCarthy era to go with our new Cold War yeah. uh, brewing through the media. And thus, an organization like Prop or Not has a, a, a propaganda or not is what it's pithy yeah. for. Uh, they've got a, a, a blacklist to uh, stain and smear uh, mostly or almost entirely online uh, journalists and uh, organizations and saying that they're either one of two things. They're e either working for the Kremlin, they're Vladimir's lapdogs, or they're useful idiots. And that it's a very interesting turn of phrase, useful idiot, because that came out of the Red Scare and the Cold War way back when under the McCarthy era. But what's interesting here, Walt, I mean, this kind of stuff goes on all the time on the Internet. It's famous for it. But the Washington Post, one of the two biggest uh, newspapers in the United States, amplified and gave credibility to this group that nobody knows the names of. We're not even sure if the reporter, who was, uh, has also, by one of the people he accused, been accused himself of working for the CIA, but uh, we don't know the names of these people. They, their identity is hidden because they say that they'll be attacked by these hordes of uh, trolling Russian uh, hacker bot people. And so we, we're protecting them from that, from that. But what they've done is they've done exactly what they accuse these other organizations of being. They, they've got an anonymous um, accusations with poor documentation, but and an nefarious plot to ultimately push America into a broader fighting stance in Syria and the region and of course nix the whole Syria deal and there's other things afoot too but yeah. you've got to watch this fake news and this proper not when you hear fake news being uttered and it is by CBC and in the European Union just put laws against it just recently the parliament there when you hear fake news just prick up your ears Chris, I'm so sorry, but that's as far as we can go today. We could, we're just getting started. <laughs> we're just getting started on a good conversation. But uh, thank you for coming in and warning us about that. I'm, you know, the New Year's coming, and we have lots of time to go over this material again. And uh, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming in today, and uh, we'll see you at, uh, next year, hopefully. Oh, thanks a lot, Well, So that concludes this segment of Citizen Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, uh, today we have with us Mehdi Najari, and Mehdi is uh, a long-term host of uh, Hidden News at CFPV Radio. And uh, Mehdi's been covering a lot of the issues uh, pertaining to uh, what's been happening nationally and provincially, particularly around issues around uh, oil and gas development and, and politics. So uh, welcome to the show, Mehdi. Thank you. Now, uh, we're going to sew together a few issues today, you know, we, and, and, and I mean, there's so many things to, to talk about, but we have these three big issues with us in British Columbia, pipelines, tar sands, Site C down. And, and, and there's a relationship between those three. And I think we, sh we should go over that. And then also should, we, should, we should touch on um, how this new Trudeau government got elected and, and how these decisions are being made now and on on the, these these different uh, developments. So uh, firstly, um, 
I think I think we know that uh, uh, Mr. Trudeau did make a number of promises before the uh, before the election as he was trying to get elected, and he was saying that he was going to be much more consultative with the public and and much more. Uh, sensitive to environmental issues. Do you think he's been doing his job in that department? He totally betrayed every promise he gave in this area, in environmental area and, and other places. We can talk about, for example, the democratic reform, changing the electoral system. He's going to back off. But on, uh, on environmental front, he promised that he's going to change, overhaul National Energy Board that was under the Harper was filled by lobbyists from the oil industry and the shoddy science that they were pushing. Yeah. It was it was corrupt uh, entity that yeah. needed to be overhauled, and that's what he promised. In Did that happen at all? Have they done no, anything? Not yet. Not okay. yet. And he, here in 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 August of 2015, here in in Esquimalt, Kai Negata of uh, uh, Dogwood Initiative asked him. Here is, the, here is the, the question Kai asked him. He said, does, does your NEB overhaul apply to Kinder Morgan? And, tr and Trudeau responded, yes, yes. It applies to existing project, existing pipeline as well. So that was his promise. Right. He come to power, he totally betrayed that promise. Yeah. He did not overhaul any... Uh, National Energy Board, and he did not create a respectable and, and a process that people can have confidence on. Particularly that with consulting with the First Nations. With the First Nation, and also he promised to respect science and make decision based on evidence and science. Yeah. None of those things is he, he has done. So has he, rel he relied on the evidence that was presented to the uh, to the National Energy Board during the old Harper regime, the, exactly. And he's not looked for anything new. No, mm -hmm. and and he is not. Uh, you know, he 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 promised to respect the rights of Aboriginal people. Yeah. He said he's gonna he's gonna endorse the the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Rights, and that means that means prior free prior and informed consent for the project yeah. that affect. Aboriginal people. Yeah. Now he's saying, no, I don't need their consent. No, I don't need to, to engage them in an informed way. Yeah. I, we, I make decision in national interest, and that's it. Yeah. But is it in national interest, the decision he made? He wants us. He's trying. He's a drama teacher. Remember that. He's a high school drama teacher. He's trying to, to make us believe that the corporate oil industry interest is the same as the interest of the people of this country and our national interest, which is not. Yeah. And that, uh, that has to be, you know, become clear for the public. In terms of Aboriginal people, just look at the devastation this tar sand is creating in Alberta. Mm -hmm. After they are done with, with the tar sand in Alberta, yeah. nothing is left for people of Alberta to live on. Now, it had, the tar sands does have devastating environmental impacts for the local indigenous people. Yes, for in, in Fort Chipman, 200 miles uh, down the down, down yeah. Athabasca River, they are dying more, uh, they are dying 30% higher rate of cancer, some very rare cancer. The animals' concentration of toxic levels of... Yeah. of uh, heavy metals in animals, in moose, in muskrats, in, in all the animals that First Nation are using in fish are highest, right. very high. Here is, here is the preeminent scientist, water ecologist, Dr. 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 Uh, David Schindler. He is showing a fish with, with the tumor on, on it from, from Athabasca River. Is the health of the people important? We had, you know, the government of Alberta from all these years is denying the health effect. But we had as early as 2003, 2004, Dr. John O'Connor, yeah. a physician in the area, were warning about the effects of tar sand mining on Aboriginal people. In 2007, Dr. Kevin Timoney wrote a report. In 2008, Alberta Cancer Board study said that 30 percent higher rate of cancer in 2011, Dr. Schindler wrote a report on the toxic material in Athabasca River. 
In 2013, Dr. John Small, Queen's University, talk, uh, wrote a paper on toxicity that caused by the tar sand. In 2014, University of uh, Manitoba report about the, the higher rate of cancer. All this has been ignored. People can die. Everything can be can be sacrificed at the altar of corporate profit, the bloody profit that they want. And our yeah. government, instead of be our government, they are there to manage us to, and implement, while they are managing us, implementing corporate agenda. You know, it just flies in the face of uh, Trudeau's statements of saying that they, they followed the sound science. and <laughs> it, 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 You know, there's such a dichotomy between what he's saying and reality. And now we've seen this in politics all the time, where it seems that they can say these things and gets repeated off enough in the corporate media. And nobody asked them, where is the scientific basis yeah. of supporting it? Where is the scientific material, the yeah. studies that you supposedly have done that support this nonsensical yeah. decision that you made? Let yeah. me tell you this. There is 66,000 well. Oil, oil well in yeah. Alberta that is, that is not being used anymore. They used it up, and yeah. it was the duty of the oil company that dig them yeah. to, to decom decommission them. The commissioning of a well costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. There is 66 thousands of them there that they are not doing their duty, yeah. the contract, under the contract. Who are they going to do that? Who is going to do that? Yeah. is us when they run away when they finish up yeah. with the oil they are we are going to hold the bag and and pay for that but you know many many we're going to be saved by the ndp in alberta <laughs> we have an ndp government in alberta now a government for the people rachel notley is saying that uh that uh there, although she is in favor of all these uh, oil and gas developments that that uh that uh, we can't move too quickly that we have to we have to pace ourselves before as we enter into this new age of... Mr. Uh, 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 Trudeau is saying the same thing. We are in the transitional period. Yeah. But le look at the facts. Right now, you know, in 2005, the production of uh, tar sand was about 760,000 barrels per day. Yeah. To the, in 2014, was around 2.4 billion. Now is, now is less because of yeah. the... Uh, because of the... It's costly yeah. to... to, to and the, and the price of oil is down. If this pipeline go through, they are going to increase production to about close to five million barrel per day. Yeah. This is accelerating the destruction. Yeah. This man, and then he's talking, he's, he wants us to believe that yeah. he's transitioning from a carbon economy to non-carbon economy. What they are doing, they are buying time for, for, for oil industry yeah. to, to devastate and squeeze every dollar of profit from our land and yeah. leave the people of Alberta and people of Canada a wasteland. Yeah. Only 1% of all the land that they disturbed in tar sand area has been rehabilitated. And that yeah. rehabilitation is a funny word because it really, when you take 200 feet, depth of 200 feet of surface of a landscape and destroy the the wet, uh, the, the, the wetland and everything yeah. else, the boreal forest, you cannot rehabilitate the land. But even though, let's, let's go with their, uh, with their nonsense about rehabilitation, they haven't rehabilitated less than, only less than one, one percent because it costs millions of dollars. Yeah. And if when they finish, it's gonna cost us hundreds of billions of dollars and they are gonna run away and the government of Canada is going to squeeze people of this country yeah, to pay. The, the, the clean up that mess. If, if Mr. Trudeau was honest with us, he would say, let's the, the oil company start, yeah. start decommissioning those oil wells and rehabilitating the land. That is not what he's asking yeah. for oil company to do. He's just giving them a little bit more time to devastate. Well, you know, the thing is that also is that where is the big initiatives federally and provincially towards uh, renewable resources? You know, if, it, if they're talking about a transition, then there must be a whole heck of a lot going on in that department. But I don't, I'm unaware of anything going on. He's, he's creating a lot of a smoke screen in order to push this corporate agenda yeah. through. 
the whole thing is about corporate profit. And yeah. these guys are all corporate lackey, yeah. corporate puppet. Mr. Our prime minister, the highest school drama teacher, yeah. is not there to protect the public interest. But you know, Matty, this is what I'm wondering about, because we're, we're, you and I and our friends know about, uh, we've always uh, been seemingly on the, on the opposition of so many developments and so many things happening in this province. And, and we've had a, a bit of a lonely life at times because of our views. <laughs> but now you have a situation, Matty, where we're talking about the city of Vancouver now is going to have a pipeline jammed down its throat. The population of the lower mainland, were, you know, pretty unanimously against this, this development. I'm wondering, what do you think is going to happen as as time goes by and this pipeline starts to get built, do you think that opposition is going to stay that high or will it dwindle No, I, I think we have to build up an opposition. He was right. Trudeau was right before election. He said the government can grant per, uh, permit for this development, but only the communities grant permission. <coughs> <laughs> now, after the election, he's saying, no, I'm am, I am granting everything. And, and so, so the people, if, if peop yeah. the people, that the families, the, the young people that have children, if you want a future for their children, you yeah. have to st stop this project because this is going to devastate the future of yeah. this country. This is a treasonous yeah. decision they made. Anybody that loved this country, I came to this country 29 years ago, yeah. and I put my hand on on the Bible and I said, I defend this country. Yeah. I, I, would, I would never betray this country. This, this decision is betrayal of this country and we should yeah. not allow it. But it's such a strange thing, I mean, let's just end on this, is that they're, they're pumping this tar sands bitumen into a pipe and they're sending it off to the coast and they're gonna send it off to burn someplace, probably in China, uh, but but it's unrefined. Yes. Why are they not refining this stuff here? In because, because the corporation want a quick profit. They don't want to create a job. You know, yesterday Mr. Trudeau is saying 15,000 jobs. That's nonsense. It's only maybe less than 50 yeah. permanent jobs will be produced. But what is going to happen, these pipelines with bitumen in it, it's a higher temperature and higher pressure. There is much more time for, in the pipeline for, for corrosion and rupture. We are going to pay throughout, yeah. uh, you know, throughout also Alberta and British Columbia. There is going to be a lots of leak. All people have to do, please go to the Google and Google the, 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 the how, many, how many leak the, the pipelines from Kinder Morgan has. This is not a good company. This is a company that caused so many problems in United States. People have died because of the leakage of their, yeah. uh, their uh, pipelines. It's very, very dangerous times we live in. Mehdi, thank you so much for coming in. I'm sure we're going to have you back and continue on this conversation in, in the next year. And that completes our segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, we have with us today Professor Trevor Han Hancock from the School of Public Health, the University of Victoria. And uh, Trevor's going to talk to us today about the idea of the carbon budget and what we have to be looking at in order to manage our carbon budget. Welcome, Trevor, to the show. Thank you. So just give us an outline of what that concept is for, for a carbon budget. Well, the concept comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is yeah. the global authority on the science of climate change. And there's a pretty uh, clear relationship between the amount of carbon you put in the atmosphere and the impact that has on temperature. And so what they have done is they have estimated just how much carbon we can pump into the atmosphere without going above 2 degrees centigrade, which is the target that was agreed uh, a year ago at the Paris Accord. Now the two degrees centigrade, is that uh, like the in inevitable peak temperature that we're going to reach before it could possibly cool down? Or wh what is the two degrees centigrade? Well, two degrees is, is just a target that the nations have agreed upon that the science suggests we could live with that much climate change, that much yeah. global warming. Um, the more you go past that, the more dramatic the impacts become. Yeah. Um, could we live with a four degree change? It would be tough, six degrees certainly. 
two, four and six degrees doesn't sound very much, but on a global average, it, 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 which is what it is, yeah. uh, it's a huge difference and it will have dramatic impacts. Okay. So, so in, the, in the carbon budget, uh, are, is that where uh, uh, they're asking for all governments to participate uh, based upon their, their production and uh, the manufacturing? How does it all work out? Well, what they've done is they've said, okay, the target is two degrees centigrade. That's what we've all yeah. agreed to. How much carbon can we put into the atmosphere? Yeah. And what they do is they go back to about 1870 and look at the, all the carbon emissions that we can calculate have been d made since then, because that's when we really started to accelerate our use of initially coal and then oil and gas. And if you take all of that and you do the math, which they've done, I have not, yeah. um, it turns out to be about almost 3,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide is what we can afford to pump out over the period from 1870 to wherever we are. Yeah. And right now, we're at about um, 800 gigatons short of that. So we've already put out 2,100 or more than that now. That was a 2011 figure, yeah. was 2,100, uh, 21 gigaton, 100 gigatons. The target, or not the target, the limit really, is 2,900. Now, is, uh, say the carbon that's been pumped into the atmosphere in the last 100 years, is that all still remaining in the atmosphere? Is there some dissipation of the old carbon? You know, what happens to this stuff? Well, one, one thing that happens is it goes into the ocean and yeah. ultimately um, into marine sediments. But, of course, when it goes into the ocean, what we're now seeing is ocean acidification. So yeah. we're beginning to see in, uh, lower pH in the, in the uh, ocean. Yeah. And that has implications for... Uh, any animal in the ocean that grows uh, a shell uh, or for coral, things like that. So that 2,100 2, gigatons is where we're at right now. Right. We're putting out about 40 gigatons a year. So we will hit that, their target or, or their limit of 2,900 in about 20 years' time if yeah. we carry on the way we are. Beyond that, we're moving into amounts of carbon dioxide pumped out that will take us past two degrees C. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's such a disconnect. I mean, these are, this, is, this is how it works. This is how the, the physics of the world works. You, you, we have a very thin layer of atmosphere and you start to alter it, you're going to get these very real effects. Um, it, it comes, it's such a disconnect between the facts and what we're hearing, say, in the media and the news where we have uh, politicians deciding to give us more oil and gas production. Yeah. And, and uh, how can we turn this ship away from the rocks, I guess is the question. What do you, what do you think, what the, can the public do to, to, yeah. to, is it, to demand more in a way that the politicians have to listen, I guess? Well, I think first off we have to get out there the facts and the knowledge um, yeah. that there is a limit in if we want to stay below two degrees centigrade, which is what Trudeau signed on to, yeah. um, and and all the other world leaders. We have only about 20 years before we hit the amount of carbon yeah. dioxide that'll take us past that. We have to turn this ship around in 20 years, but we have to understand that math first. I wrote a column recently about politicians yeah. failing the climate math test because this is basic math, yeah. and they're not getting it. Uh, and there's too many interests that gain from the short-term profits of pumping out oil or, or, or gas or coal or tar sands, but they're not acting in the public interest. And Trudeau, in approving the pipelines the last couple of days, is also not acting in the public interest. He's acting in the interests of one province, Alberta, and he's acting in the interests of the oil sector, but he's not acting in the interests of Canadians. It certainly doesn't seem that way. You know, um Information is, is, is the key, you know, and that's one of the reasons why we do this program is that, yeah. I mean, I, I learn a heck of a lot just sitting here and listening to people like you, you know, uh, give us the facts the best you, that you know. And they're well, the evidence that you're presenting is well based upon on scientific, uh, you know, uh, procedure. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, 
it's it's uh we're, we're at a, just a, never have, have we been really at the, quite the loggerheads between these two competing interests. People that want to save the planet and the people that want to make a lot of money, want to make a lot of profit. But you see, those two are not incompatible, and that's part of the yeah, problem. Yeah, that might be the secret right there. Oh, I think it is. We can I let mean, them make money yeah. doing good things, how about? You know? Well, and exactly, and if you look at um, the energy sector, you know, the, the, uh, there was a group of Canadian scholars a couple of years ago that looked at Canada's energy picture, published a report through uh, McGill University, and they concluded that within about 20 years we could get to um, a, a renewable energy system, that we have enough wind power and solar power across the country that we could do that. Um, at least, I think it was about 80 or 90 percent. I mean, yeah. it's just it's really close to where we need to be. <coughs> but the other thing is a lot of the technologies that, that will do that also require jobs, also require investment, also yeah. make money. So the first thing we need to do, I would say, uh, well, the first thing we need to do is stop approving pipelines. Uh, as the uh, authors of a recent report said, if you're in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> and we're in a hole when it comes to our carbon emissions. Yeah. We will pass the target in about 20 years. So we have yeah. to stop. There's already enough uh, according, to the, this is a report from a, a company or an organization called Oil Change International based out of New York, yeah. reported a couple of months ago, based on data from uh, 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 one of the key energy uh, reporting agencies in Norway, there's already enough coal, oil and gas either un in, uh, being used right now, being developed or under construction to already take us way past the target. So. We don't need any more. We yeah. already have enough in, in the pipeline, as it were. So we need to stop. That's the first thing. Now, Trudeau's what, what, what made a big mistake. What countries seem to be taking the good steps you know, that you could refer to? Well, as I was talking to a friend of mine recently in Canberra, the city of Canberra, it will yeah. be um, fossil free in, uh, in 2020. The, okay. So they, they're coming off coal based power for, for this whole city. Yeah. Uh, there are places. Um, like Denmark that use a lot of wind power and solar power yeah. and all the rest of it. Uh, there are companies now um, developing energy systems in, uh, in the far north for remote Aboriginal yeah. uh, communities yeah. there that are using uh, renewable energy up there. Yeah. So we've known, we've known about the technology for 30 or 40 years. The other thing we need to do is right now the oil industry or the fossil fuel industry in general gets a lot of subsidies. Yeah. Well, stop. Stop the tax breaks, stop the direct and indirect subsidies. Take yeah. all that money and put it into uh, supporting renewable energy. And that would give the renewable... That, that it wouldn't change is, our tax so bill at all. That's that they actually... You take, really, one of the most profitable industries in the world, yeah. and, and it, it's hard to believe that our government actually gives them quite huge subsidies. Well, there's subsidies for exploration, subsidies for yeah. mining, all that sort of thing. And it's not just us, it goes on around the world. Yeah. But if we just stop doing that, I mean, one of the things about, as they say, you know, if you're in a hole, stop digging, don't keep doing what's not working. Yeah. And what we're now doing is continue to do what isn't working. Take those resources, wouldn't change our tax bills at all to take that money away from oil and put it in your renewable. It would cost us the same amount. Yeah. But it would be the right incentive instead of the wrong incentive. You know, there's other like low tech things like, you know, heat pump technology, something yeah. I'm aware of and I see it in my everyday life and a lot of friends yeah, have heat pumps in their homes and such and the energy consumption is like some, between 50 and 70% less than, than yeah. comparing it to uh, electricity or oil fired uh, furnaces and such. Well, and the other piece in all of there are two other pieces in this. Um, one is that the single largest source of energy is actually conservation and efficiency. Yeah. So if we just used energy Not more efficiently <laughs> or didn't use it at all, if, if you didn't commute or if you didn't travel, yeah. uh, you save a lot of energy. If you make pumps, for example, or homes more energy efficient, yeah. those are the things that were cars, we've already done that to some extent. Yeah. So, so that's one piece. The other thing is you have to look at the real costs of the energy system. So um, some colleagues of mine um, in um, California and, and around the world who, who've written a couple of recent major chapters on energy systems, yeah. the, health, the overall health impact of our energy systems 
is equivalent to the impact of tobacco or alcohol or high blood pressure. So there are huge energy costs, not just yeah. from global warming, but from air pollution too. Yeah. Massive so, costs. So, you know, in the end, um, what do you think would be um, sort of the, if one wanted to uh, take the steps in their life, in their personal life, to, to reduce their carbon footprint, uh, what are the things, steps that public can do that really, really help, helps out really quickly? Well, I think certainly uh, moving to more energy efficient homes yeah. or, or improving the energy efficiency of our homes. Transportation is a big issue. We need to be, um, for example, I live near the big new interchange they're building yeah. at Mackenzie, um, on the, you know, Mackenzie and, and the, the highway. Right. Ridiculous waste of money it's going to mean that drivers get to their next traffic jam in two minutes quicker, but it doesn't solve any problems. Um, and it's, uh, if they had taken that money and instead they had used it to build telecommuting centers in, in the Western communities, yeah. so people could go 10 blocks or 20 blocks to their neighborhood telecommute center, yeah. at least some people some of the time could do that. If on average, everyone out there who currently commutes on average one day a week didn't commute. You yeah. cut traffic volumes by 20%. That would be huge. Yeah, that would be. And you so know. there are those kind of things. We know how to do that. I mean, yeah. I teach. My entire program that we teach in yeah. at UVic is online. Yeah. I rarely go to the university. I don't leave home that much. What would think, because uh, you know, the, with the, all this online activity, you know, you really think about it, that should be taking traffic off the roads. If and, you design and, it right, it will. And, and I, so I come in down past the Mayfair Mall, <laughs> coming into the show, and there's so much traffic. I can't ever remember seeing as much traffic as I'm seeing these days. Yeah. And you wonder, well, what's going on in that behavior? Of course, it's Christmas time, isn't it? Yeah. You're getting into shopping behavior and all that. More stuff. But anyway, look, it's always, there's always hope. It's, that's, that's the bottom line. We can change our behavior. We can make demands that, that make our governments work yeah. better the for us. The answers are there. They're we there just for have, the taking. We just have to simply uh, demand it more, perhaps. Exactly. You know. So that's wonderful, Trevor. Pleasure having you with us today. And that completes this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to the Citizens Forum. I'm just going to take the opportunity to thank all the volunteers and staff to make this, this show uh, possible. And uh, it's uh, greatly appreciated by myself and by the public, I'm sure. So uh, we have uh, Brian Virtual back again with us today. Uh, Brian's with the organization called Arrest. And uh, Brian can tell us what Arrest stands for. The Association for Responsible and Environmentally Sustainable Sewage Treatment. So as you might guess, we're talking about the sewage treatment plant again. And we, we, we just have to reiterate the, these points that we really think that the, the decision-making processes and the design all have serious, some serious flaws. So welcome back to the show, Brian. Thanks, Walt. Now, you did, you, the Freedom of Information request is still ongoing. Can you update us on that with the federal government? Yeah, that I sent in uh, about third week of September and they were to reply within 30 days and at 32 days I got a reply saying that they're going to take another 60 days thank you very much so they're saying they need 90 days yeah. to uh, be able to come back with this science that they keep referring to. And that's what science. you've been asking you've, uh, saying, you've just asking they, they what just science keep have referring, you used? Using expression the science so I said what science? Please yeah. give us the science and uh, so far there's uh, it looks like stalling that uh, they haven't given it to us and they've, they're extending they're allowed to, to extend, to give themselves more time. Um, they shouldn't require it because since they say that they're looking at the science, yeah. it should be right there so on somebody's desk or in Pretty somebody's... Pretty easy to grab that you would think. index and it just be... photocopy it and send it off to you, right? But anyway, it's not happening. So it's, yeah. that should be, their next deadline will be up uh, sometime around the middle of December. And let's see if they send something. Um, right so now. anyway, let's, let's just go over... Uh, uh, well, by the way, what was the gist of uh, the Environment Minister McKenna's reply? Uh, Along the same lines, you know, again, her reply in October was that um, this has been uh, approved, the regulation has been approved by yeah. 19 jurisdictions and so on. Um, so what I'm writing back and saying, but what they've approved has a flaw in it. There's yeah. a fundamental flaw right in the regulations. 
And no matter how many people keep approving, have approved the regulations, they haven't corrected the flaw. So they haven't really gone over and, and added any new science from the old... Uh... No. Once again, the minister has said, the science shows yeah. that blah, 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 there will be monumental great benefits to the environment and the economic benefits. And so I've said, once again, writing back to the minister this time saying, again, please show us the science. Because if there is valid science, yeah. we're all going home. We're done. But We'd so love far, to see that. So far, all we have is the expression of their science without actually them actually showing any science. I, again, it's, 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 it's such a wild disconnect between There's, reality and, and, and what's really happening. What I've also pointed out to the minister here, that this issue, that there's essentially two sides here. Yeah. There's politicians, there's the business community, uh, the, uh, tourism, is, they're saying, well, it's hurting tourism, yeah. and yet tourism is having record years. Um, and, and the business is pushing for it because they want the, the federal dollars or the federal and provincial dollars injected into the local economy. And politicians are pushing it. And on the other side, it's the science community, uh, it's scientists, engineers, uh, people in, in fields of law, economics, um, uh, public and family health. They're, yeah. you know, they're saying this doesn't, as well as the general public are, yeah. are saying that this doesn't have to be done. Yeah. So we've got. It, it, there's lots of evidence saying it doesn't have to be done, and yet the politicians keep pushing it along. What are, what are the major and, flaws in, in this plan? Okay, and one other thing, because yeah. I haven't uh, mentioned this before, and I really think this is important to put out there, is that Victoria keeps getting n um, nominated, elected, as one of the most beautiful yeah. cities in the world. We just got it last month from uh, an organization, Conte Nest, I think is how you, yeah. Conte Nest, I think is how you pronounce it. A hundred thousand people in the United States voted and made and voted that Victoria is the seventh best city in the world. You can't get something like that if you've got a sewage problem, yeah. you know? And yeah. the beauty also was in the article that Conte Nest wrote, Conte Nest, it's they, one of the places they say to go is to the waterfront, yeah. out on the breakwater, which is right there where the discharges are. Yeah. They're completely oblivious to the fact that's where the sewage, that's how good our sewage system is. Yeah. Anyhow, so, so the city keeps getting these awards, but the city wants us to spend a billion dollars to fix a non-problem. Uh, I think that's, I think that needs to be pointed out. And well, anyway, for that's, sure. that's, I going, mean, that's mentioned to the minister. This. But you know, what, let's go over the flaws. The flaws. Uh, the the main, flaws in this plan, because I mean, people have to The main flaw this. in the plan is, as the marine scientists have yeah. recently written, is that the procedure for determining our risk, what, how yeah. much risk is our present system? Obviously, it's extremely low risk yeah. if it registers. <laughs> extremely low risk. But the procedure in the regulation says we're high risk, which yeah. is absolute nonsense. And as the, 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 the phrasing that the marine scientists used was that the procedure within the regulations is meaningless. Mm -hmm. The procedure that the regulations require the CRD yeah. to have used to determine risk is a meaningless procedure. How could that be? Because, as we've said many times before, the regulations were written for protection of drinking water, fresh water. Yeah. So they're biased toward fresh water. And they were, the regulations are wonderful for fresh water, discharges yeah. into fresh water. What they are very weak on is for discharges into the ocean. Yeah. And, and as the scientists have pointed out, is you need a very different procedure to determine risk for discharges into the ocean. It's because the ocean water and fresh water are obviously entirely different, entirely different yeah. chemistries. So they've got one size fits all procedure yeah. for both fresh water, for two extremely different environments, fresh okay. water and salt. So water. now we end up with this proposal, McLaughlin Point. Yes. And, and, uh, and, and I don't know how we can set aside all the shenanigans up to that point, but let's just say they made this decision. They're going to build a McLaughlin Point. What kind of a plan are they going to put there? Well, Let's, let's just uh, do a quick summary of what we uh, okay. uh, did the last, the last show. Okay. And then, so we've got time to move on no, to some new good. points, all right? Last night we pointed out, was the article in Focus Magazine is yeah. pointing out that, according to the engineers, that the plant is going to be, I'll call undersized, because what we expected was a plant that would be able to uh, handle uh, capacities up for another 20 years before yeah. it starts to uh, bump up against the... Uh, Overloading it, yeah. being overloaded. But apparently, it's going to be, start being overloaded almost as soon as it's built. 
somewhere Green within market. a five-year range of two years, 2018 to 23, 2023, it will be start to be overloaded. So it's an under, it's an under, you know, it's going to be built to the capacity that's required on the day that it's completed. Rather that's than so for remarkable. 20, right. So then what so, do they have to do to so keep then, the thing going? But, but, yeah, the solution, they, they know that, and they've told the CRD, the engineers have said, but the plant can carry on operating by adding chemicals. Whenever the overload occurs, they add chemicals, which is a very con controversial procedure. It's done elsewhere in Canada. It's being used in Ontario. It's, there's a lot of problems with it. Very controversial because once you start adding the chemicals, which help to speed up the removal of the sludge, the sludge then becomes useless. You can't use it to spread it on the land. Incineration operations won't take it because of the chemicals in it. Uh, but also this undersized plant, which is being sold to us as um, well, it's cheaper, therefore yeah. it's good, is well, the undersized plant means that they're going to have to start building other plants. We're going to end up with a distributed system, and which is what the CRD said in the first place they didn't want because yeah. it's more expensive. So, okay, it wants to get this built, they're already wanting to start, was it $2 million was approved for checking out, right. building uh, another plant out in the Western communities. Yeah. Another plant, and perhaps even a third plant, this is what uh, the Focus Magazine yeah. article points out, it's prob probably even a third plant, hundreds of millions of dollars more. So this project is definitely going to be well over a billion dollars. Yeah. Um, so the question was, that you asked last time yeah. too, was that were the CRD directors aware of the shortcomings of this plan when they voted to approve it on September yeah. 14th? That's unclear. There's some indication, yes, they did. Maybe they didn't. The thing is, if they didn't know, why didn't they know? And if they did, were they responsible in approving of it? I think David Broadland's article is right in that milieu of trying to figure out what happened there. You know, yeah. why? Why wasn't this information so readily available? But I should, that's a good point. Is yeah. He tried to present that information to yeah. some CRD directors. Presumably some did get it and open up their email. Yeah. But his main point is the public was not aware of this yeah. information. This information, if the CRD directors did have it, yeah. it wasn't given to them publicly. And that, he's saying, is a, a flaw. Because the Environmental Management Act requires that there's... Um, uh, collaboration with the public. The public is exactly. supposed to be. So that's what he's saying is that was a, f a flaw in the process. Um, what we also pointed out uh, last time in, on your show also was that people say, let's just have a referendum on it. Yeah. Well, that right to referenda was taken away in the Local Government Act and the Environmental Management Act. They removed our right to um, referenda on sewage treatment plant. Yeah. So we don't have that right. So what uh, the article uh, proposes is that uh, perhaps there should be a legal challenge. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, Mr. Broadland apparently spoke to a lawyer in Victoria and went over it. Yeah. And so he has some legal advice on the, uh, whether or not to proceed, whether or not a legal um, challenge uh, would be a wise it, Has the public responded to, to yes. that? Yes, they have. Um, yeah. And they are responding, they're still responding, even from Vancouver, as a matter yeah. of fact. People are responding to his article and just expressing support for a legal challenge. Um, Mr. Broadland is passing those, uh, those con that contact information right. along to arrest, and arrest is um, going to put this together. Uh, so, what would be the basis of that legal challenge? Have well, they formulated that yet? Half, first of all, what we want to find out is how many people would support. Uh, so yeah. that's so we're we're appealing to people to yeah. either respond to um, the. The, the Focus magazine itself, or directly to arrest right. at our email of arrest.association yeah. at gmail.com and express support to us. Uh, and if we get a large enough number of people showing support for this, yeah. then we will proceed. We'll start fundraising and we will uh, go to lawyer or lawyers to start it. And what we would almost certainly begin with is uh, what uh, Mr. Broadland has suggested is that we have been... Um, denied opportunity to have input into this and right. because because our right to referenda has been taken away it's this seems to violate some fundamental law in canada yeah. that we should have access to um, input into something as important as a project as big as now, this it's it appears to me i mean i and then i'm not that plugged in to this situation 
But given just the evidence that you've just outlined here, we know there's some big problems with McLaughlin Point. Yes. And it appears also to me that I think a lot of those elected representatives, a lot of the CID directors, really weren't in the know. I, it appears that way to me because how could they just really just go ahead and pass this? They, there's some are so adamant that this has to go ahead. Yeah. Mayor Lisa Helps, chair of the sewage committee yeah. herself, has said that, quote unquote, she is hell bent to get this project done. And I'll repeat that I have organized a meeting in her office with the marine scientists. I sat there and listened to their presentation as they explained to her yeah. why this should, and she just simply said this project will go ahead. She is absolutely dead set on making this happen. And there are others, other directors who have the same view that be damned with the facts and the science well, and the evidence, I know, we're going to do this project. We had a bad idea 10 yeah. or 15 the, years ago to do this. It's still a bad idea today, but we're not going to budge. They are the body that should appeal to the federal government to yeah. point out the flaws in the regulations. We would look, if we do a legal challenge, if there's enough support, we should look into that too to fight to have the regulations, the flaw corrected, right. which would which would give us the proper deadline that should be for our system, not 2020, but 2040. You know, the deadline, uh, uh, which I always tried to figure out for sure if it was, if it was for real or not. Like, uh, and, and they're, it, they're for real, that's, that's written into the regulation. It, there yeah. is, there's a deadline. The other thing that's not yeah. being done is if we have a, a challenge, is to have them follow the guidelines. That's another thing, yeah. is that the guidelines that go along with, there's the regulations, yeah. and then there's guidelines on how to implement them. And those are not being followed. There's spo supposed to be cost-benefit analysis done, and that, that kind of those things are being bypassed. Well, we're still waiting, Brian. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll but, sure, sure want to hear what the government has to I, say I, if I, they finally answer you. Thank you. I just want to once again close with an appeal yeah. to people to please respond to the uh, Focus magazine or directly to our email and let us know if they would support a legal challenge. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes our show for this week, and we'll see you next week.